Hello, and welcome to episode number 239 of the LSR Podcast. My name is Matt Brown, joined each and every week by the brightest minds in all of the gaming industry. With me, I have Adam Candy. You can find him over on the Twitter machine, Adam Candy. That's two E's, no Y. If you hate yourself, you can follow me at Matt Brown M2. Of course, we are on all of your favorite podcasting platforms, so do appreciate the little subscribe button hit, the little rate, the little review. We will take anything four and five. If you're a three, just, just back. It's fine. It's fine. Continue to not leave a review if you're going to do a three. Um, Adam, a good time for us to kind of say here on the podcast over the, as we head in towards the the fall, we're going to be booking more guests here on the podcast. We're going to start getting some more diverse voices on here, tapping into your resources over at LSR and Legal Sports Support to have more people come in on some stories that they have worked on, on some research that they have worked on. And all of that. And it's, I know everyone loves just listening to me and you. I've gotten the feedback. I hear it all the time, just how much they love listening to just me and you. But we said, you know what? You know what we're going to do? You're going to love listening to the two of us and a third person. To be clear, what they have said, Matt, is we were so tired of listening to Dustin Gowker. It's such a relief to only listen to your (laughs) dulcet tones, Matt Brown and Adam Candy. Thank God that Gwerker guy is gone. (laughs) <laughs> That's pretty much what what happened. If you're listening, Dustin, that we only got one like one email that said that. That's 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 it. So don't, don't worry about it. We're going to talk about some M and A here. A little bit of M and A. We're going to talk about what's going on in D.C. Good news for you guys over there. An interesting story coming out of the U.K. But Adam, this uh, I kind of usually hear scuttlebutt and stuff and whatever in the industry. I know you do as well. But then this story that we're leading off with kind of hit me out of nowhere i was like i thought something like this i would have i would have heard i would have heard some rumors i would have heard whatever but uh it i'm sure it was I, since we didn't talk about it off air i can only imagine it was kind of a, a shocker to you too the fact that something big was coming in our space via court was something that had been teased a bit on social media but what it ultimately became <laughs> in the last 24 hours was in no way expected by any of us in the sports betting space. And I'll start the discussion of Jacobs v. DraftKings v. Spanky uh, with this. <laughs> if you want all the details of the filings here, go to LegalSportsReport.com. Matthew Waters wrote up the initial filing by Stephen Jacobs. He will, by the time this posts, he will have written up Spanky's long and detailed <laughs> response to this. And you'll get all of that situation laid out in front of you. Now, let's give you the basics of this. A lawyer in New York named Stephen Jacobs filed a lawsuit against DraftKings alleging that DraftKings conspired with Spanky. And if you are out there on sports betting Twitter, you know that he is a professional better who makes his uh, voice quite loud at times on Twitter. And the accusation in here is that DraftKings leaked personal information about Jacobs to Spanky and an associate of Spanky. And then Jacobs was allegedly threatened by a masked person saying that he owed Spanky half a million dollars and that he would be killed if he did not pay up. Now, this lived out there for most of the day before Spanky put out a long and detailed response. And the crux of his response is that My associate and I identified this guy as a potential beard for us, right? We identified him as someone we could use to get money down at DraftKings in large quantities because Spanky himself is banned at DraftKings, something that he openly discusses in that long Twitter thread. Yeah, and this so, is not new, by the way. Yeah, to no, anyone that's kind no, of paid no. attention to him over the years, like he, it's a almost a badge of honor, you know, of of the different places that he's been limited or banned and whatever and stuff like that. It, it is, yeah. and it's you know not just about DraftKings; it's about a number of legal sports books. So I'll leave the details of it there, Matt, and we'll get more into discussing this case. I'm sure as it continues its way through the court system or doesn't because DraftKings has already moved for it to be dismissed this week. We'll see what ultimately becomes of that. But Spanky's accusation is essentially, yeah, this guy got himself deep into debt and is suing as a way to try to get himself out of what he owes me and my associate, which is 
more than a million dollars. Uh, it's a wild case. There's a lot to unpack in here. But Matt, I think what you and I will ultimately get into discussing here is this is the strongest evidence in the, uh, I guess, in the spotlight, in the daylight that we have seen of the games that professional bettors play mm -hmm. in terms of trying to find beards or people that they can use whose hands are clean to get money down at sports books where they've been banned. Yeah, so if you guys don't know how this works, sometimes you will hear a lot of these dudes that are, you know, not only just single operation, you know, syndicates, et cetera. Uh, look for outs. You know, they will be, hey, if, you know, if you, how many outs do you have? How can we get a hold of those? Is there anything we can do to kind of partner up and stuff like that? Of course, there's a vetting process that goes along because, Adam, as you well know, if someone comes in and they are, you know, and if they're freshly out of college and haven't had a real job yet or anything like that, like that is going to blow up all the KYC stuff that happens on, uh, you know, with in any sports books. And you're not going to be able to get down any money. That person is useless to a syndicate or to a guy like Spanky or whatever it might be. So you actually have to go find people who, whenever there is some work done within the sports books, that it kind of all checks out, right? They've got income. They've got disposable income. They have whatever, et cetera. So it, it is a process, and it is like, you know, it's a little bit more elaborate, I think, than a lot of people even want to to acknowledge. It's just there's some sophistication that goes on in all this stuff. I know that there's this uh, almost like, Hollywood thought of what a professional gambler and professional better looks like and how they act and what whatever but like that's not present day and that's not really what goes on with all this these guys are just these guys are grinding spreadsheets and grinding algorithms and and have bots that are giving them information also like that and then the other side of the business is what you just mentioned is actually just finding ways to get the money down right I mean that's like the other biggest thing is being able to get down the volume and the amount that they're looking to get down uh, when it's all said and done. And so, as you mentioned, this this is kind of the first time. You, we knew it anyway, and honestly, most of them are not are not shy about talking about it either, right? I mean, like, this this is something that is just, it's kind of like hidden in plain sight. You know, like, everybody is everybody knows it's happening. They talk about it, but you don't really hear and see stories and stuff about it. But as you mentioned, this is kind of the first time where we, up close and personal, get a, a, a look at this. No, this is a guy that we used because it all checked out with him and it was a dude that, you know, we were able to get down decent money with because it all, it looked like he was able to afford to make these bets. I would point actually Matt to something that your friend and mine, uh, Gil Alexander had on the VEASAN airwaves a little while back where he has regular appearances by Bill Krakenberger, a guy who's well known, I think, uh, you know, from the action documentary and also to anyone who pays attention to media in the sports betting space. And, Bill gave a pretty impassioned speech on uh, Gil's airwaves there to say, you keep trying to ban us, we'll just keep finding beards. We'll keep finding mm. new people. That's just part of the game. And it is an open discussion and an open cat and mouse game between the sports books. And not always just the legal sports books, right? It can be yeah. at the offshores as well. This sure. is not a problem that's unique to U.S. No, no, no. or anywhere else's legal sports Great books. Point. This is... This is something that goes on everywhere it's not something that we say oh well the legal market is unique to this no, it's not it's not the case at all so we will see what ultimately plays out here in court i think the most interesting part is that you know i mean i pose this question to some legal folks to say is spanky in some way incriminating himself in something that yeah. you know he shouldn't be doing and you know would it be potentially against the law in some way um you know, the initial reactions I got were that, no, it wouldn't be. And, of course, why would he be out there incriminating himself? Yeah. It would be hubris uh, to do that. It would be more about the violation of terms of service at DraftKings. And guess what? Not particularly concerned about that, right? Like, that is not his, uh, his number one worry because if you were worried about that, you wouldn't be doing it in the first place. Is just another example of, Matt, why we talk about the fact that Limiting, as we've discussed on the last couple of podcasts, limiting and banning is such a hot topic among the uh, among the sports betting Twitter, among the legal folks, among the regulatory folks. And we know that the Massachusetts Gaming Commission is going to come back to this topic uh, in August. We talked about that on the last podcast, one of the first times that we've seen U.S. state level regulators try to get themselves involved in the discussion in some way of how legal operators go about this. Matt, you tell me, I have to feel like a situation like this 
will only help the sports books in their case for saying, hey, this is a real problem for us. There's only so much that we can talk about because we're dealing with these high level things that are a major threat to our bottom line. Whether that's true or not is for someone else to parse out. I'm just thinking from the PR perspective. Yeah, and you bring up Bill and and Spanky. They're two of the biggest voices about the whole limiting and banning thing and stuff like that. And and Adam, honestly, I like their position on it too because there needs to be that voice, right? There needs to be those people who are saying like, well, here's what here's the links that I have to go to in order to be able to bet legally inside the United States, right? So I, I think that they're... I like their side too because they're giving you firsthand experiences and all these things. And as you've, as we've also mentioned, it can't just be a free for all. So we understand somewhat what the sportsbook side of all of this is. And it is why whenever we talked about this last week, I honestly believe this is going to be ongoing is going to be the hardest discussion for us to have in this industry, because there is at least a general consensus amongst how should advertising be handled? What should and shouldn't be said? How do we go about this? What's the frequency that makes sense? Like, yeah, there's a little bit of debate there, Adam, but there's a general consensus on how that should go. Like all these other hot topics, you kind of get to where there's some sort of middle ground. Whereas this, I just, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know the right answer because as Bill, you said, goes in on Gill show and says, or Spanky, you see in this type of deal, if you want me to bet legally in the United States, you don't want me offshore, you don't want me bookies, stuff like that, then I got to find somebody that I can get money down because you won't let me get money down. And so it just becomes this incredible circle that we're going to go through. And I do believe at some point there will be the, the states stepping in on something like this. I don't know if that's anytime soon, but I, I do believe at some point there's going to be the state stepping in and say, listen, if you're going to offer betting, you've got to at least offer X amount to every person that comes in because this is this is not just, we're not going to let you have one-way traffic on all this, right? Like this isn't, while while we understand there are choices out there, if you guys are all doing the same thing, there's really no choice. And don't think that this is something that is, you know, magnanimous by the states to promote clean business. Yeah. They have an interest in this. Yes. They want to get as much revenue in for their tax collection as possible. Why else would they choose to regulate beyond what we've already discussed with responsible gaming and the ability to better track betters and the ability to potentially help problem betters? That is a real thing. But it is also a real thing that they want to maximize the tax revenue that they're getting out of legalizing sports betting. And if large dollar betters are clearly saying, hey, I'm not playing in the legal market because I can't get any money down, that is a voice that has to be listened to, much the same as it is the sportsbook voice that needs to be listened to when they say, yeah, these guys are using all sorts of avenues that might potentially go against our rules for how they get their money down. I'm not telling you anybody is right. That is a right. much, much larger discussion for another day. And there probably has to be a solution that lands somewhere in between those two extremes. It is. It's, a, it's fascinating and something that I know we're going to talk about, I mean, all the time here. On the podcast, Adam, for a hot minute there, there was a lot of M and A. There was a lot of M and A talk. We were wondering what was going on. Now it kind of kind of settled down there for a while. But here comes some news out of the MGM world about an acquisition. A typical situation in these typical <laughs> times for uh, those who might enjoy the Dave Matthews Band. Mm -hmm. uh, typico, one of the lower market share entries in the U.S. that had, of course, made significant money in Europe over the years and really hadn't cracked much of the uh, much of the egg here in the United States has sold its US facing business to MGM Resorts International so one less brand in the US market what is key to this deal is understanding that MGM plans to use the typical assets and by that we mean the typical tech mm -hmm. to further its rest of world product. This is not something that goes to BetMGM. The purchase is actually being made through Leo Vegas, another previous purchase by MGM Resorts. Bill Hornbuckle had teased the fact that there was an acquisition coming here as MGM tried to better its sports betting and iGaming product internationally. And that is where the typical assets will be focused. Financial terms not yet discussed, although we are coming up on Q2 earnings reports. So you assume that we will get more information in that at the very latest. But as of right now, what we know is that one of the smaller brands in the United States, another, I should say, of the smaller brands in the United States 
is no more. And Matt, it's the consolidation that happens in every new business mm-hmm. that comes up and around. We have just seen a lot of it come from similar places with foreign-based entries that have not necessarily been able to capture what it is that the U.S. sports better is looking for or just has not been willing to invest the resources at the volume and pace of losses that some of the Mm -hmm. larger operators have been willing to do in order to establish themselves with market share. Yeah, we always talk about the giants in the industry and in DraftKings and FanDuel and Adam, you know, we we know that there's money behind Caesars and MGM because of all of the the legacy stuff and all the land land based casino operations and whatnot. The thing that we've kind of been preaching was, okay, if you're if you're not one of the brands that everybody is super familiar with, and you're not one of the big two in DraftKings and FanDuel, you kind of like better be doing something different. Like, how else are you going to separate yourself? You better be doing something different. I talked to a couple of buddies. You know, I have some friends that are that are. Uh, pro to semi-pro betters over uh, up in Colorado moved to Colorado actually whenever Colorado got going because of all of the market access that Colorado had there were just so many sports books up there that everybody wanted to move where there were the most outs and um Tipico never came up right you know just as, as one that that people were, were betting on using for any sort of certain thing there were never any of the crazy bonuses there were never any of the differentiating factors inside of an app or markets that were available et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. and so it's kind of one of those deals where we look at this and you're, there's DraftKings and FanDuel, then there's, you know, basically everybody else that, as we talked about in previous podcasts, some analysts out there say is not even a level two, there's just a level three. There's like, there's level one, there's no, skips level two and goes down all the way to level three. And it's the it's the deal. We we mentioned, at least with Fanatics, maybe there's some sort of bonus thing where, you know, you're you're tapping into the collectible side of deals, whatever, and that's at least different, right? That's what we've always talked about. Like, at least try to differentiate yourself some way, shape, or form. And Tipico really never did that and kind of was an afterthought even for us here on this podcast. Hell, what have we mentioned them three times in the in 200 episodes? Yeah, I think the most important thing to keep in mind with whether it's Tipico or whether it's a number of the other small operators, there was a thought over the last, let's say, 12 to 18 months that maybe we pivot the whole idea to waiting for iGaming, right? Mm -hmm. That when iGaming launches, potentially it's a different market, we'll have a different advantage, we have a different set of customers that we can try to bring into this. And I think what's become clear throughout the last 12 to 18 months is that there's not going to be the same velocity to iGaming being Mm -hmm. legalized at the state level that there was to sports betting being legalized at the state level. There are 38 states that have some form of legal sports betting and you're looking at seven right now for iGaming, and any of the momentum that began this year was minimal in terms of what they got done in 2024 and what could be coming in 2025. And so I think any smaller operator that thought maybe we'll try to hang on for the next iGaming launch is realistically looking at the landscape and saying it's not coming in a time that makes sense for us to make a profit. Adam, it's the only time we have ever said on this podcast that if you live in jurisdiction X, you should just you should just keep betting offshore. Like, like you should just you should just keep doing it because there's no reason for you to enter the legal market. But that's what we said when DC legalized. It was the biggest joke of a launch that we've ever seen. It was the most off market, off cra- off brand, off craziness that we've ever seen in any sort of launch when it came to lines and markets and all the things that were going on out there. But DC slowly started to get their act together a little bit. And now if you do live in DC, it looks like there is light at the end of the tunnel slowly started to get their act together might be the nicest thing that you can say about (laughs) how dc ultimately decided to make changes to its sports betting market recall the fact that dc started out with a single operator model right they decided to go with only one mobile sports betting operator and instead of going with any of the established or upcoming operators they decided to stick with their lottery provider intralot for a product called Gambet DC. And this turned out to be maybe the single biggest failure in legal sports betting over the course of Gambet DC's, uh, let's say, ignominious tenure Mm -hmm. as the only platform in DC. We were seeing that when it was William Hill and then Caesars, that a physical sports book where the Capitals and the Wizards play was consistently outpacing the online app in terms of uh, handle from D.C. residents. Why? Because the odds 
and the usability were that bad for Gambit DC. And when, when I'm talking about the odds, I'm not saying, oh, well, there was a nickel difference in a line. Yes. Right? This isn't 110 versus 115. This is your standard sides being offered at minus 140, minus 150. And people who have any serious interest in betting looking and saying, no, uh, the tipping point for me in terms of will I walk down to a kiosk versus <laughs> will I place this bet in my underwear yeah. is placing an extra 30 or $40 on a $100 yeah. wager to make the same bet. I'm just not doing that. It's also the same uh, app that crashed during the Super Bowl. And so even if you wanted to bet from home, you didn't have the option. So what we've seen now is uh, council member uh, Kenyon McDuffie pushed through a change via the B DC sports betting, uh, I should say through the budget process for sports betting in DC that is eventually going to open up this market to more operators. What it does in the short term is FanDuel is established as the new preferred operator in DC, but it also will give the sports franchises, which have been able in the past to make deals with sports betting operators, but then only offer their app within a two block geofenced radius of their stadium. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, cool. To now Fun. be able to do this district wide. It could be up to seven uh, of those. So you're finally going to see a modern competitive market in Washington, D.C., which, Matt, I don't know if you know this, is a pretty high per capita area in terms of income. Yeah. Yeah, and there's more people in D.C., I think, than people realize as well. And so this is huge. It's big news and also just good for the consumer. We talk about this all the time. Like, having options is good. Being able to make people do the right thing is good. And when there's only one option and there's only one thing out there, sometimes people don't make the right choice, and that's what we saw for sure with Gambet. I'm glad that you, you brought this here, Adam. This is a story that most 99% of the stuff we talk about here on the podcast, you can go to Legal Sports Report. You can find the written version. You can kind of get more in-depth details on all of that stuff. But uh, this is just a, some interesting news that was out there. We thought it'd be worth a couple of minutes. Those who follow LegalSportsReport.com know that our focus is on U.S. and Canada mm -hmm. news for the most part. However, there are times that news from overseas I think is worth us discussing, especially in the context of where we are on the calendar right now. So if you've been watching what's been going on with the U.K. Parliament, you know that legal election betting exists in the U.K. Uh, and some people who should not be betting and some people who had information that they allegedly should not have had have been betting. And what it has led to is a major, major scandal in the UK in which two of the leading parties in the UK have had to have their candidates removed, stepped down for leading those parties in the election because of alleged irregularities in terms of betting. One candidate bet on himself to lose and said he was going to give the proceeds to charity, a number of police officers and other folks involved in integrity allegedly used inside information about when the date of the election was going to be set. Because if you know elections overseas in the UK, it is not one static election date like it is in the United States. Well, they apparently had some inside information, allegedly, that allowed them to place wagers on this market, which, according to Reuters, is a very popular market in the UK. And for our UK-based listeners who hear me say, according to Reuters, sorry, we don't follow the market as closely as <laughs> we do in the US. But here we stand, Matt, in June of 2024, just a few months away from the US presidential election. And we have heard over and over and over again the debate of whether election betting should be allowed in the United States in legal markets. You and I have been on different sides of this issue in the past. I don't imagine that any of that changed mm -hmm. overnight, but this is something that needs to be strongly considered by any market that is doing this. And in terms of the markets that we cover, uh, Ontario in Canada does allow legal betting on the U.S. election. Now, that's a different story than allowing folks within the same country to bet on elections. I've always brought up the idea of people betting their financial interests instead of betting uh, their political or community interests in elections as a potential problem with election betting. I wasn't thinking about the actual candidates themselves uh, trying to get action down, nor was I thinking about those with inside information inside politics trying to <laughs> place bets as well. So 
quite the cautionary tale for any country, not just the U.S., thinking about how to do election betting going on right now in the U.K. Yeah, no, it's certainly interesting. And it, the main thing, too, is is the fact that there could be inside information involved in all of that. My stance has never been that there should be crazy big election betting. Mine was more for entertainment purposes only, right? So limit it to 100 bucks, whatever, 200 bucks, whatever it might be. And it's like you could get a little bit of action down on, you know, who you think might win election X, Y, or Z or something like that. It was never a, hey, let's make this a full-fledged market. One, it's just... It's just a little dicey, as you mentioned. It does make it for things that are, you know, if we want to really get into the moral side of things and all that, like, there is a side to talk about with that and all that. So for me, it was more just an for entertainment purposes only type of deal. But then you hear something like this. That being said, we, we do have static dates when elections are happening. We, we aren't betting on what date the election is going to happen. We aren't betting on things like that. It would just basically be who's going to win, who's not going to win. And get down, a, you know, some some a little bit of a, a little bit of a sweat, I guess. Is it needed? Not really, right? I mean, like, if it, like that's kind of one of those things we were talking about with like the college props, right? Or the props that are available for the thirteenth guy off the bench or something in the NBA. Is it needed? Not really, you know. I mean, like, like what's it gonna really do to the bottom line? I mean, like, yeah, once every four years in a presidential election, you might actually get some handle, but then it's three years in between, so it's kind of like. Do we need to really, do we really need to have a market for something out? Do we really need to legalize something? Do we really need to go through all of the, all of the jumping through hoops and the backflips that it would take to do this for something that the handle is really only going to matter once every four years anyway? And also, Matt, as we discuss integrity and people's trust in betting, right? We've had so much conversation about leagues getting into partnerships with sports books and what that ultimately means for people's perception of whether or not there is an integrity threat. And you mentioned mm -hmm. the 13th guy. You mentioned the John Tay Porter situation. You can also talk about just how close MLB ended up flying to the sun with wax wings in the Ipe Mizuhara and Shohei Otani situation because if Otani had been found to be anywhere near the Ipe Mizuhara betting, it would have been a scandal of 100 times the proportion of what it ultimately became. Now think about what would happen if we were talking about the integrity of an election that were compromised by betting markets, that is something that would probably swallow up the entirety of legal U.S. sports betting. And you want to know what would get Congress involved in, in legislating on sports betting? That is what would get Congress involved in legislating sports betting immediately because then it would be their own interests that would be threatened. And we know that that's generally when action would be spurred. So is the juice worth the squeeze, to put it real short? I don't think that it's anywhere close. Yeah, it's just if it, it'd be different if like it was a, a year round thing every year. But again, it's like you're going to get meaningful handle once every four years. So it's kind of like, is it is it really worth it? I just don't think it is. We're not betting on, you know, one, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a market anyway on your like local election. So that's not going to be anything. Anyway. No one's betting on who's going to win governor or whatever, like, you know, it's just not, you'd get the, you'd get the handle of what you get on cornhole, you know? So it's like, what's the point? It's just no the, point, you know, for that sweet, sweet cornhole handle. I'll yeah. tell you what though, if, if I were able to bet on Matt Brown as mayor of Summerlin, I think oh. I might actually want to get, I, I like, I don't know who would book it for me, but yeah. I, I want that action. I don't think, uh, I don't think I want people digging into my, into my past so i'll just i'll just stay you know yeah, I'll, just say, <laughs> I'll just i'll just not run for any you know run for anything or whatever you know man thank god cell phones didn't have cameras uh when we were in college so oh oh you, a, you you sir are a smart man yeah that's a that's a that's a good thing guys as we said everything we do absolutely free so all we ask of you and support is going ahead and hitting that subscribe button that is uh what you can do to help us climb up the charts and Bring this podcast to more ears out there. We're on Apple, Spotify, Google, et cetera, et cetera, all the different platforms. So do appreciate all of that. The words to everything we talked about today, obviously outside of the the UK election stuff, you can find over at LegalSportsReport.com. So please go in, take in all of the good work that Adam and company are doing over there. They're, they're listening to these things. They're reading these things. They're summarizing these things. So you don't have to. Just remember that. For Adam, I'm Matt. Talk to you guys next week.